For the new members, my name is Franca Hernandez, and uh, I've been a member since uh, 2012. Um, but I did come even before then to um, selective, selected um, presentations back in Smullen, so you know that I go back quite a ways, and I love every lecture, so I would sneak in. And, they, uh, and I gave a presentation one time on Victorian women travelers, which is, and at that time I had uh, Lindsay Hauser, who is an actor. I didn't know that at the time, but she is a real professional actor, and she consented to do um, a one-act play that I had written that I integrated into my presentation. And uh, right after that, I got a membership. <laughs> Maybe it was just cheaper because you know than paying me an honorarium to make me a member. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's the introduction to who I am, and uh, the the um, the French Canadians, the French Indian families of Shampooey, is a story that still needs to be told. There are uh, elements that we have hidden in the past, but we need to bring it forward and we need to make it part of our Oregon history. Right now it's still not a part of our Oregon history. So history is never an orderly series of events that arrive at a seemingly predestined outcome. The exploration and exploitation of the Pacific Northwest could have gone to the British just as easily as to the United States or to France. Wars, battles, love, famine, and disease sometime causes one path to be plowed rather than another. Out of the hundreds of stories of the settling of the Oregon country, I selected only a few. The original Oregon country was the vast region west of the Rocky Mountains from Russian Alaska to Mexico, Mexican California. The 1790s, trading ships seeking precious furs Beaver and otter started landing along the Pacific coastal North American continent in the late 1700s. Euro-American maritime fur traders arrived at the mouth of the Columbia River and made contact with Lower Chinookans. The traders tapped into an established Columbia River trading system. The Ahanchuyuk Kalapuyans of the Willamette Valley were part of a vaster trade network which included Upper and Lower Chinookans, Salish, and Alabascan communities. The Chinook economy was centered on developing trade relations, sometimes secured through marriage alliances. The major exchange was, however, slave, salmon, and dentalia, which are um, ocean mollusks that resemble um, tusks. This is uh, what, you can see the British territory, you see Russian Alaska, and the Mexico, the Mexican secession, and then the area that was called Oregon country, unsettled and undetermined. And of course, there's a whole swath of unorganized territory in south, I mean, still west of Iowa and the other states. Commercial and sexual relations with Native women and Euro-American men began in the 1790s and continued with each succeeding fur company personnel. The fur traders were thus included in the kinship network of the Pacific Northwest. The relationships, business and personal, were short-term or long-term. The labor and diplomatic skills of the native women were crucial for the operation of the trade. Marie Melinda Jette wrote, they managed resources, processed animal pelts, and produced essential foodstuffs, clothing, and other materials. Perhaps most importantly, native women worked as cultural mediators, directly involved in the trade negotiations between fur, between fur traders and the local indigenous groups. It was during this period that the Chinook Wawa, the lingua franca of trade, was developed. 
1805. President Thomas Jefferson commissioned an exploratory expedition by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Arrived in the region, they met a Chinookan with red hair and freckles by the name of Jack Ramsey. And he knew his name because it was tattooed on his arm. He was one of several children born during the stay of a sailor marooned on the coast about 30 years prior. And those are the pictures. Because back then they didn't have photographs of the people that did the explorations did do drawings, which was precious. This is what we have left. So you can see Jack Ramsey and his brother George. In 1810, Etienne Lucier, French Canadian, joined the Wilson Price Hunt Overland contingent of John Jacob Astor's Pacific Fur Company. How many people read the book Astoria in here? Okay, good. That's good. All right. After the American Fur, uh, Pacific Fur Company was dissolved during the War of 1812, he entered the service of the British Northwest Company and finally ended up a, brig a brigade leader for the British Hudson's Bay Company. Alexander Henry and several personnel from Montreal, Canada, came to support the British Northwest Company. He kept a thorough account of his explorations in a personal journal. He observed with great interest the coastal environment and the culture of the Chinook Indians. Quote, their canoes are many, one for the sea, one for the river, and the smaller kind for fishing. 1812, John Jacob Astor's American Pacific Fur Company set up operations at Fort Astoria. The British leader, the British leader named it Fort George. So the reason I picked this particular picture is that when we study Oregon history, we leave off everything else, which doesn't make sense, because the fur network, as you can see, went all the way back east, and in great part in Canada. So a lot of the stories that I'm, the story that I'm gonna tell you right now could be um, a micro story that is, that blossoms in many places in Canada and the Pacific Northwest. So there is a, there was at this time, very active, very vibrant um, trains, uh, not trains, excuse me, wagon trains of people going to the Northwest following the fur trappers and traders, and a lot of them a lot of them were Native American women. And the reason I'm wearing plaid is because a lot of them were married to Scottish people. So plaid enters very clearly into the way they dressed, the way the women dressed. Um, Pacific Fur Company set up a winter base in the Willamette Valley within the Chimawa, Chimekata, Chicha, Mikiti tribal region located along the territorial line between the Ahachuyuk and the Saniam Kalapuyans, and a few miles south of French Prairie. Clerks William Wallace and John Halsey administered the outposts with several laborers and their uh, three hunters, John Day, Ikanash Son Sonowane, that's Iroquois, and his family, and Pierre Dorian Jr., French Sioux, and Marie Lagouvois, she's in Iowa, but known as Mary, as Madame Dorian, and their son Paul. Later clerks John Reed, Alfred Seaton, Thomas McKay, and more laborers joined them. Over the winter and spring, the Astorians trapped beaver, hunted wild game, and traded with the local Kalapuyans. The area was open prairie, few forested hills, and easy access to the Willamette River, known by locals as Willamette. This became the location of intercultural contact and trade. The Kalapuyans lived on preserved food and wild game. Berries were harvested farther afield. The women processed both the wild game and animal hides. The subsistence economy remained um, involved maintaining the oak savanna woodlands through managed prairie fires. 
Shampui's name derived from the Kalapuya term, Kampuik, C-A-M-P-U-I-K, an Ahatsuyuk village. The Willamette Valley is roughly 110 miles long, width of between 20 and 30 miles, with an area of 3,500 square miles. And to do this, uh, I'm, I'm doing research in that area, and I've driven over there, and I still look, and I can't believe how much land there was and how blessed they must have felt arriving there. Flowing north, the Willamette River is a major tributary of the Columbia River. The Willamette Falls separated the upper Willamette from the lower Willamette. The climate was relatively mild, rich in oak savannas with clusters of Douglas fir, alder, and laurel. Understory plants were various grasses, shrubs, ferns, and berries. The area also included marshes, sloughs, and swales home to the blue camas. Timberland contained white ash, big leaf maple, black cottonwood, western red oak, excuse me, western wet, red cedar, and Douglas fir. The Kalapuyans viewed marriage as an exchange between families, and men could have more than one wife after paying the bride price. A father with many daughters could increase his wealth that way. Kinship and marriage alliances formed the basis for social, economic, and diplomatic relationships in the Willamette Valley. The fur traders were American, French Canadian, and many of whom were Matisse and other nationalities. The French Canadians had a long standing rapport with native people and were adept at negotiating trades of fur and other supplies. 1813. The British Northwest Company bought control of the fur trade operations of the American Fur uh, Pacific Fur Company of the well, um, excuse me, of the Columbia River Basin. Um, Fort Astoria was now Fort George. The native people of the Oregon country had long established customs of gift exchange, tribute, and kinship ties that extended privileges to non-family members. Of course, you know what gift exchange is. Tribute is like a tax. We'll let you live here, but you need to pay us or give us something in exchange for the privilege uh, to be here on this particular piece of land or this hunting ground. And kinship, of course, through marriages. This privilege was also extended to non-family members, people outside of the tribe, outside of the area. The non-natives created personal liaisons with the local native women, some of whom were mixed blood from prior maritime contact. Mariage à la Fasion du Pays, common law unions, Alexander Ross, Scottish, one of the fur traders of the merchant ship Tonquin, 1811, was married to Sally and Okanagan, Columbia Plateau. They had children. <coughs> so if your last name is Ross, who knows? You probably have some... Um, some Métis or Native American blood. The American Pacific Fur Company was dissolved. Uh, some French Canadians went back to Quebec and some stayed on to work for the British Northwest Company. Some became freemen trappers and were engaged to trap fur in the Willamette Valley. Joseph Saint uh, Amant, Etienne Lucier, Francoise Martial, Jacques Hartot, John Day, Moses Flanagan, Mikai Jabaker, um, Richard Milligan, Alexander Carson, and William Cannon. And the breakdown of the ethnicity of the people that were involved, one thing I learned is that we're a lot more Hawaiians than we, than we had imagined, that I had imagined from the reading of Oregon history. So there were six Hawaiians just in this one excursion. Four Iroquois, which are Native American. Then there was, I can't pronounce that, Native, Native uh, Canadian. There were two different Canadian uh, tribes. And 16 French Canadian and one Euro American. The Willamette Valley people were dependent on the resources of the land, game, roots, nuts. 
for their subsistence. It was not their custom to depend on trade as the Chinookans did. The traders ignored the native territorial boundaries and depleted the landscape, creating tensions. The native people had looked upon them as guests and did not understand the fur traders' unwillingness to share in game and furs they had procured, but they had guns and the native people had only bows and arrows. That's why some were accused of stealing. They weren't stealing. They had uh, an agreement to share everything and they were just taking what they felt was their due for allowing the people to use their land. Thomas McKay, a Matisse Canadian, who had come west with the American Pacific Fur Company, stayed to work for the British Northwest Company in 1813, and later worked for the British Hudson's Bay Company. His father, a fur trapper, was Alexander McKay, and his mother, Marguerite Wadeen, a Matisse. There was tension between the Kalapuyans and the Canadians, two groups with diametrically diverse cultural perspectives about land and resources. The Europeans based their notion of conquest by the doctrine of discovery, thus claiming unilateral property rights, ignoring the evidence of prior occupancy. The convention, of the, the convention or treaty of 1810, 1818, I'm sorry, recognized joint British and American occupancy for the Oregon country. 1821, the British Northwest Company merged with the British Hudson's Bay Company. The original engagé of the various fur trading enterprises, after years of living in the wilderness, enduring the uncertainties of a dwindling supply, were ready, a supply of resources, were ready to retire. A large number stayed in Oregon country. Some of the American Pacific Fur Companies and British Scottish Northwest Company's former employees continue to work free, freelance providing furs. Uh, so uh, I don't have a pointer here, do I? Okay. Um, so there, can everybody see all the details? Yeah, you can, Marion County and you see the Willamette River. Can you see the Yam Hill River? Somewhere near, um, somewhere near New Dundee? Wait a minute, no. Farther on, farther on. Newburgh, somewhere around Newburgh. And you see the Shampooey area, and you see Donald, you see Aurora, uh, you see Wilsonville, all of that. Uh, I drove that whole area trying to get material for this, for this um, presentation. And uh, it is, it's still in amazingly beautiful. But it's still strangely absent, all the street names, all the areas, still absent of French names. I thought that was very strange. So the original engagé, and they came here and they decided that they wanted to settle. Some of the people that decided to become freelancers were, was Joseph Sanamont. Thank you. Alexander Carson, William Cannon, Etienne Lucier, Joseph Gervais were among many who had established long term relationships with Native women from various parts of the Pacific Northwest. Eastern Oregon and Canada. The Willamette Valley had a mild climate, amazing soil, grass for cattle and horses, timber, fish, and game. The open prairie was ideal for cultivation and grazing. The bottomland forest, oak, and oak savannas, wetlands, wet, uh, lowland prairies, and forest foothills supplied the native women with useful plants and roots, such as wapato, camas, and berries. Later, they grew crops of peas, barley, winter wheat, and raised hogs, horses, and cattle. 1825, Jean-Baptiste Deporté uh, McKay, also known as Dupati, and I believe, Irma, you said there's a picture of him at the, or his name at the Capitol? Yep, okay. A French Algonquin, free trapper, and his wife, Marguerite, a Kalapuyan, 
were part of the dozens of native labor class who decided to stay in French Prairie. Dupati also had another wife named Catherine Chehalis, with whom he had two daughters, Marie and Lisette. It's reported he had several wives and slaves. 1826, Etienne Lucier and his wife, Josephette Noet, now lived on a semi-permanent basis with their family near Shampui among the Ahant Chuyuk Kalapunyans. The Columbia River nations had a long-standing slave trade network. Etienne Lucier's first wife, Josephette, might have been a native of Vancouver Island and a slave of the communities of the Columbia River Basin, and that's how uh, Etienne met her. The 1830s, the annual epidemics, including the reoccurring epidemic malaria, decimated the Kalapuyans by 92%, leaving many children orphans with no memory of their primary families or their original cultural identities. These orphans were taken in with other families, other Indian communities, into the French Indian community, and later cared for by the Methodist and Catholic missionaries. The French Indian families of the Willamette River and Shampui constructed a bicultural colony. The native or Matisse women were integral part of the new settlements, equal partners in the labor and organization. Some of the women who entered into permanent or semi-permanent relationships with the fur traders, both French Canadian and British Canadian, were Koba Wei's daughter. He was a leader of the Clatsop. Yamoust, wife of Joseph Gervais, and Kila Kota, wife of Louis Labonte. Siliast, Clatsop, and the women, because they didn't have a last name, they were recorded with the name of the tribe that they were from, or the language group. Uh, Siliast uh, Clatsop had been married to a Basel Poitier, who, however, had a wife in Canada. Uh, she later uh, entered into a long, uh, lifelong relationship with Solomon Smith, a literate man and New Englander, who had originally come in 1832 with the Nathaniel Wyeth party. He taught at Fort Vancouver. They settled in Willamette Valley with Joseph and Yamoust Gervais, but Siliast, uh, li known later as Helen Smith, pined for the coastal lands of her people, and they moved to the Clatsop Plains. So, so you can see her, she, her name was Silias, but somehow uh, adopted the name Helen, or she was given the name Helen. And that's her husband and the, some of their children. These other pictures here are pictures that I found um, on the internet, and it was extremely, this is why my text doesn't match the pictures, because it was extremely difficult to find pictures of French Canadians that were connected to Oregon. There were a lot more French Canadians connected to An Canada and Matisse, and some of, I had to borrow some of these pictures from the Canadian Matisse. But these are examples of what um, you would have encountered here in the Willamette Valley during the time that Oregon went from being the Oregon country to Oregon territory. Uh, 1833, the French Canadians were concerned about their property rights once the international border question could, would be finally resettled. In order to secure a new future for themselves, their wives and children, the French Indian families, maintained good relationships with the local Kalapuyans on whose land they were settling, and also maintained good rapport with Hudson's Bay Company, John McLaughlin, chief factor at Fort Vancouver. Louis Labonte II recounts the close association the French Indian families enjoyed with the Ahant, Ahant Chuyuk Kalapuyans. They hunted together, their children played with each other, and the settlers were invited to marriage ceremonies. Um, wedding gifts for a marriage ceremony would be typically slaves, dentalia shells, and tobacco. During the 1830s, they also included European goods of blankets, guns, kettles, power, powder, and knives. McLaughlin allowed the French Indian families to permanently settle in the Willamette Valley. He was concerned they would start trading with the Americans and cut into his monopoly of wheat 
and other necessary agricultural staples provided by them. Jean-Baptiste Deporté du Paty Mickey, Etienne Lucier, married at the time to Josephette, and Pierre Belique, married to Genevieve French Sanuc, took up claims fronting the Willamette River in the Shampui area. Amab Arquette and his wife Marguerite Chinook located their farm a few miles east of Shampui outside present-day Butteville. Jean-Baptiste Perrault and his wife Angel, An Angel excuse me, Chehalis moved to the west side of the Willamette River near the confluence of the Yamhill River. Joseph Gervais and Yamus Classup staked a claim near the Kalapuya village of Chimawe. La Bonte and his family lived with in-laws, Joseph Gervais and Yamus Clatsop, for several years, then moved on the west side of the Willamette River to Thomas McKay's farm um, on the Scapoose uh, Plains. The French prairie settlers raised grains, domestic animals, apples, pears, peaches, peas, and beans, the exchange system was based on receiving credit and bartering with labor, goods, and services. The Matisse women of the settlement continued to make a central contribution to the family economy through labor, trade, and barter. The French Indian families, mostly illiterate, understood the benefits of education for their growing families. They also wanted to establish a real community, and as Catholics, that meant a church and priest who would provide education and religious instruction, as well as the sacraments. They wrote a letter to the Bishop of Quebec requesting Catholic priests. It wasn't until 1838, four years later, and several letters before the request was fulfilled. In the meantime, Methodist missionaries arrived. The missionaries find them, found themselves unprepared for the grueling physical work required to set up a settlement. They were disorganized and sickened by malaria and other diseases now rampant in the area. No significant efforts were made to convert the native people. Reverend Jason Lee went, uh, went from inept missionary to settler to politician seeking annexation of the Oregon country to the United States. Jason Lee never learned to speak, speak Chinook, French, or any, other, any of the other native languages. His and the missionaries' New England racialism position progressively intensified as American colonialism took root. The French Indian families were very happy to have people who would provide their growing community with religion and education. The French Canadians wanted to validate the long-lasting common law marriages they had with the native women and Matisse. The Methodists married them and baptized their children. Jean-Baptiste Deporté du Paty Mickey was required to pick one of his common law wives. The Methodist mission was fraught with problems, mostly of their own making. Despite the cultural, religious, and linguistic divisions separating the American missionaries and the French Indian settlers, the two groups enjoyed generally friendly relations during the early years of the Protestant mission. The French Indian family supported the mission by donating labor, attending, and hosting services led by Jason and Daniel Lee. The mission provided much needed social services to the decimated families victims of malaria and other diseases. Orphan native children were given a place to live and to be educated. Unfortunately, many children died at the mission and the native communities were reluctant to send any more. However, there were those who survived, thrived, and were given Euro uh, first and last names. <coughs> Mon homme.
Ma Fem, where are you? Who asked to? Tending the horses, Michelle is mending the chicken fence. The coyotes broke through. We lost three chickens. And Joseph is in the orchards with Le Fille de Gervais. David, the other children are tending to the cows and hogs. Ah, mon homme, we need additional help on the farm. And you should be here more to guide the workers. Do not worry. I will find more help. There are orphans who need a home and we have more space and food than we can use. What do you have there? our affair will meet again soon, but I do not know when. In the spring, perhaps. When you're free, please read this to me. Ah, you and Francois have much to talk about. And you still talk? What do you and me have to say all evening long in your Quebec French? Francois is a brave man and knows much, and we talk about important matters, I am concerned lest Americans may take all we have, Britain and the United States. Les Américains have been coming here since I was born. Among the Chinook, we have many who are mixed blood. It is the way of life. Uh, it's changing too fast for me, and I fear. You? 
fear? Me? I fear what I have built since the time of my first wife, Josephette, almost 30 years ago, will melt like the snow of the Cascades. You have been allowed to stay here and farm this land by the Ahachuyu Kalapuya. What else do you need? Uh, you do not. You do not understand, my friend. Among Lace Americans, land is given as you would give a blanket or a rifle, and once it is given, it belongs to that family forever. The men who read and write put words on paper to give the ownership to men, and they, in turn, can give the land to their children. What do you mean? You have been on this land since the time of my grandfather's. Who would dispute your right to be here? When your wife, Joseph, had died, you married me, a Chinook. And my family has always been here. We do not need faith to say we belong. <laughs> it was so easy in the beginning. I was a voyageur and trapper. My life was simple in the woods. The animals were so numerous, I collected them as though they were huckleberries. My wife, Josephette, and Laison Foss went with me everywhere. A good woman she was. Yes, even though she was a slave, my people valued her. <coughs> oh, bon Finn. Without her, I would not have survived here. Marguerite, you are a good mother to my orphan children, but I am old. How will you and my children survive when I am gone if ladies and their canes want this land? Shush, mon homme. What are you saying? What has brought on these dark thoughts? Etienne, when the fur trade ended, why did you stay? You have family in Quebec, and Josephette would have been accepted by them. I have fought my whole life since Mm, petite hole to make a living. My grandpapa came to Canada from France for the land and to make his way. We had our religion and wanted a place we could be Catholic freely. But the British also wanted the land to make themselves aristocrats. My people married the local women. And we plan to make America our own. But to the British, it was a place only to make money to send back to Britain. When they took over the land, they demanded to be separate from les pibak, les kibaka, snobs. It was because we married Indian women and because we were Catholic that they pushed us far to the west. They squeezed us with their civilization until we bled, and that was not enough. They wanted always more. The small farm we had in Quebec was enough for my older frere, but not for me. Those who had no land were used like slaves on the British plantations. Push, push, bleed and no time for an education. They did with the Libeca what they wanted. In Quebec, at age 17, in 1810, I discovered Un American needed men to go west with what I could earn on that trip. I planned to buy a farm of my own. 
I could make myself equal to La Britique. Marguerite, I may not know how to read and write, but I have ears and I speak to everyone. You have what you wanted? Hmm. When McLaughlin, who favored the British, wanted me to leave, I had no choice but to comply. Josephette, I, Notre Dame Falls, started our way back east to Quebec. When we stopped at the edge of the great river Shawana, she saw the salmon pushing through the waters, struggling with death. Her heart was breaking the farther we travel from the great river, the great sea. She said she is one of the people of the salmon and would die if we left this land behind. We traveled as far as the Rocky Mountains, but we did not have the heart to go on. When we returned to Shampui, McLaughlin was more agreeable and allowed us to stay. Oh, I was not born then. All I've known are the Americans, British, French, settling on this land. There is enough for all. But some want more, I imagine. Nothing changes. Hmm. My friend, I have fought for everything I have. But it is not for me. It is for my younger children whom I fear. And now, Marguerite Les Americaines, the descendants of the British, come each month like waves of the ocean. They come with their British ideas. And I fear that my mixed breed children will be pushed out. That may be so, mon homme, but I will care for them, as if I had given them life, and they, you and I, will live with my people. Who cares about le papier to these lands? We do not need them. The land of the shampoo has always been good to all people who come here. It has been the place of peaceful meetings since the time of the ancestors. Who dares to say otherwise? It makes no sense. But they come like a flood with the documents to dispossess my children. I must do something. Even the North and Etienne. We can go and stay with my people. Your children will be cared for and respected. Uh oh, Marguerite. You know as well as I, there is no place for us among your people. You have not, you have lived away from them for many years. And you are now Catholic. And in truth, neither of us would be welcome. And think of this. The Kalapunya and the Chinook and many others die each year from the trembling fever. Families are broken apart. There are so many orphans that no one knows to whom they belong. To whom would we return? The orphans who work here do not even remember their parents or grandparents, nor what name they were given. Where can any of us go? My Pierre will have a future. He will have a chance. I will do whatever I need to do to make sure he and the other children stay here. I am grateful my daughters Felicity, Adrienne, and Pelagia are settled and married. With the dowries I gave them, they will not want for anything, but my sons, they are so young. And I may not live long enough to see them reach manhood. What of them? What did Francois say? Uh, Francois hates the British as much as I do and does not trust 
He welcomes the pioneers who come here, hoping to make this land part of the United States of America. He says the Americans have beaten the British in two wars and won. My film. I have traveled over great distances to come to this land and have seen much. Nowhere have I seen the land so rich, the wildlife so bountiful, and the great river Shawana of the Chinook opens future trade for us all. Francois says, do not let the British come here and take everything. Maybe he is right. He says, I trust too much. You think Les Americans will take your land? You are good to everyone, mon homme. But you should question everything. Ma femme, we have no place to go. The pioneers who have come here are good people. Jason Lee, who was born in Quebec, and his nephew are people of God and served our need for God when for so many years the Catholic Church ignored our letters pleading for priests to come here. Once you and me and his people were brave to come to this land knowing nothing, they served our people until we could build a church of our own. They served us well until Père Blanchet and Père Modeste Deemers came. The Methodists welcomed many orphans into their fold. I feel indebted to them. They came to bring God, and as a man of honor, I must help them. Yes, they came to bring God, but remember how many children died in their care? Oh, the great fever touched everyone. You cannot blame them. Still, I do not trust Jason Lee. When I look into his eyes, I see emptiness. Don't ask me how and don't ask me why I know this. Remember that Lee and others who came here to settle have sent many requests to the government of Liz Americans to have their leaders tell us what to do. Why did he want to expand his mission, expand his desire for more settlers and more land? I say, mon homme, it was not just to bring God's message to us poor, sauvage. It was to further his ambition for land for his people like me. I admit, I found comfort to speak to another person from Quebec. In the end, I trust my heart and I will find a way to hold my land. And I agree, my friend. In my heart, I do not trust thee either. Etienne, you are a bomb. I know you take food from the storage and supplies and give them to Les Americans pioneers to come here so they do not starve. You are good and deserve a good life. We will pray to God to guide us. Let's uh, welcome Franca back. I could do a full introduction now that I know what she's doing, but I think you already know as well. So um, people were asking me, I wrote the play, you know, and that was the short version because it could go a lot longer, but anyway, that was the short version. So I just wanted to let you know, um, I did pick Etienne Lucier, and I've mentioned his name many times, um, because he's such a famous character in Oregon history. I mean, he came here when the um, Pacific Fur Company was here, and he never left. 
So if there's one, you know, Oregon um, historical figure that really merits um, recognition, is it, it is Etienne Lucier. And um, just to give you a little bit of um, after, the, after this, you can see down at the bottom, Pierre, there's Pierre. Because uh, Etienne uh, only had two children that we know of. I mean, people you know, lose children, they don't get recorded. But uh, we know of these two. And Pierre um, moved to Montana eventually, I guess, because of the racist laws that were being passed. So he lost rights to his land. And he did have a son, and there is a, uh, I didn't follow it any farther than uh, Frank Lucier, buried in Montana. So the line goes on which is wonderful. I did meet one of his great, great, great grandchildren last year, by chance, purely by chance, Kevin Smith in St. Paul. And uh, he told me that he was related, he was a descendant of Etienne Lucier. Pretty amazing. So in uh, 1830s, 1833, these, um, these are the people that were recorded in the, that were recorded, doesn't, seem, doesn't say the people that were here. These are the ones who gave their name and said, this is where I belong. And that, um, that was recorded by, and I will read here. The French Indian families were aware of the larger geopolitical pol uh, question between who of the two powers, the US and Britain, would ultimately have ascendancy over the Oregon country. They were worried about their legal title to their lands. Okay. Uh, to their lands in the event of an American annexation of the Willamette Valley. The community was growing and former French Canadian laborers wanted to secure a future for their mixed, uh, for their mixed blood children. In 1836, a letter was sent to Bishop Provincer of Red, uh, Red River and Winnipeg, Manitoba, requesting that they send clergymen. And the following put their mark on it, because remember, these people were illiterate. Uh, Joseph Gervais had seven children. He put his mark. Uh, Xavier, Xavier Ladaro La had one child, a recorded child. Etienne Lucier had six children, Pierre Belique, three, Charles Rondeau had three children, Charles Plant, uh, four children, Andre Picard, four children, Joseph Delard, five children, Louis Forcier, three children, Amab Arquette, three children, Jean Baptiste Perrault, two children, Joseph Depart, three children, Andre Long uh, Longton, four children, Jean Baptiste Deporte Mackay, eight children. He could have had more. Uh, William Johnson, two, and Charlotte Iroquois Tessete, uh, no children recorded, and William McCarty, a, there's no children recorded, but he may have had children. Um, President Andrew Jackson uh, commissioned Navy Lieutenant William Slackham to visit the Oregon country and report on British operations and to take stock of the tribes and the resources in the area. He toured French Prairie early that year and found about 19 families living in relative harmony. There uh, was about 42 acres per family with an annual wheat uh, production of 551 bushels, of which surplus was sold to the Hudson's Bay Company. Etienne Lucier and his wife, Josephette, had a grist mill. 1838, oh, and these are the families that were recorded as being settlers in the 1840s. Um, Etienne Lucier was around here. I can't see at this angle. La, okay, Jean-Baptiste, Deporté there. Somewhere here is, is Etienne. And then Pelique, oh there he is, Etienne Lucier. All the way down here. St. Louis, there's a cemetery, Pioneer Cemetery. That's my hobby is to visit Pioneer Cemetery, so go on and on about that. And, and we have some that are, that I've listed all the ones I saw on here. 
that are not listed in the report. But you can see how many there were all the way to Labish, all the way to, to Salem, all the way over here. So all of this, this Indian French prairie. 1838, uh, Jason Lee and Philip Edwards uh, drafted a petition to the US Congress asking them to annex, uh, to extend, excuse me, its jurisdiction over the Oregon country south of the Columbia River. 36 men signed the petition. The signatories included 10 members of the Methodist missionary mission, 17 Euro Americans, and nine French Canadians. That fall, two Catholic missionaries finally arrived, Francis Norbert Blachette and Modeste de Mers. In preparation for the priest, the French Indian families built a church in present day St. Paul. The women and children were baptized, some for the second time, because remember they were baptized and married by the Methodist. Then of course the French Canadians got married again and baptized by the Catholic priest. So if I were a Methodist, I would not be happy. So I can see that where that would create some tension. And their common law marriage was solemnized by Catholic rite. Uh, this is a replica of the first Catholic church that was built there. They built this church well in advance of the coming of the priests, probably a couple of years in advance. Uh, Fa Father Blanchette instituted religi religious instruction and practices. The priests married 27 couples and baptized their children. The marriage data confirms that although the women of French Prairie were ethnically diverse, Nearly all were born in the Pacific Northwest. Approximately 45% of the women were natives of the Lower Columbia along the major fur trade networks and the Willamette region. 25% came from the Plateau, Eastern Oregon and Idaho. 22% were Métis women of French Indian ancestry. 70% of the men were French Canadian from Lower Can Canada, Quebec. The remaining were three Irishmen, three French Indians, one Iroquois and one Frenchman. A uh, little bit of trivia, polygamy was not uncommon, just the kinship relationships, especially, especially with regard to all their children, was to say the least complicated. Father Blanchette was indulgent, compassionate, and patronizing of the French prairie flock. But even he, based on his training in the East, tried to impose parameters. He did, not get, he did get pushback from the men and also from the native women wives. 1839, oh, this is, these are all the people that married. So what this is showing, you can see John, at the very top, John Horde Irish, a little side note about uh, John, he um, opened the first distillery of Irish whiskey, and so there was a big hullabaloo about that. The French did not like that because alcoholism was um, a really big problem among the French Canadian. So they tried to get people to take the pledge for sobriety. That's why I included that into the little one act play about that. So, um, but he was there. You can't, um, I don't know, you can't unsing a song or something. <laughs> And uh, the, all the French Canadians, you can see um, Irish, French Canadian, and then one Iroquois. And they all married a women, uh, local native women. What this also shows, I, mean, I don't want to forget this, what this also demonstrates, and this is what Professor Jete, who wrote the book based on this, that I use for this information, uh, is that the people intended to stay. They were not fur traders who are here today and gone tomorrow, or nor mountain men any longer. These were people who had clearly every intention to stay on their land. Eighteen forties communication by letters and word of mouth from the traders, businessmen, and, and settlers to people in the eastern parts of the United States reported a land bounty, just wait, a land of bounty just waiting to be properly exploited by the Euro-Americans. The Kalapuyans of the Willamette Valley had by this time become accustomed to the increased presence of the Hudson's Bay Company expedition through their valley on their way to southern uh, Oregon 
and Mexican California. The Euro-American immigrants found the Willamette Valley a diversified, dynamic economy. The French Indian families were able to meet their subsistence needs and supply the Hudson's Bay Company with surplus wheat and other grains for export to Russian America. 1843, the American and French Indians maintained a demographic parity in the valley before the major uh, American migration of 1843. When they arrived, they found the native peoples of the Willamette Valley, Ahatshuyu, Kalapuyans, and others already impacted negatively, not only by the diseases, but also the effects of overexploitation of the natural resources of the valley. Uh, 1841 through 1843, the settlers and the overlanders, which are the new newcomers, had to find ways to deal with the issues of legality in their now shared community. They all turned to the religious leaders for guidance. In 1841, two events needed to be dealt with by the community. Jean-Baptiste Perrault was charged with theft, and Ewan Young died intestate. With regard to Perrault's case, Father Blanchet said that the French-Canadian community ought to deal with its own. The Methodists argued that it was preferable to have a legal system modeled on the American system. The French Indian community agreed with both. They said they would deal with Perrault's case in their own way and also submit to the civil authorities created by the Methodists. So Perrault was actually given two judgments. It was after the death of Ewan Young at public meetings involving the whole community that it was proposed to create a legal system process by writing a constitution, a legal code, elect civil authorities, among which a probate judge. There were differing opinions between Father Blanchette and the Methodist leaders about who had authority to appoint civil personnel. <clears throat> In the end, representatives from both communities were appointed. Uh, Ira Babcock was selected Supreme Judge with probate powers. Babcock, Babcock used the laws from New York State as a model. George Le Breton was court clerk and public recorder, which means he needed to be obviously literate. Uh, William Johnson is high sheriff and longtime settlers Xavier Ladero, Pierre Belique, William McCarty as constables. Um, another committee was drafted. Uh, Another committee would draft the Constitution. Jason Lee, David Dampierre, Gustave, Gustavus Hines, André Califo, Robert Moore, Josiah Parrish, Etienne Lucier, and William Johnson. Etienne Lucier, who did not know how to read and write, must have been a very clever man for people to value his opinion, his input. They would meet at the Catholic mission. Small individual parties of Americans. Sorry. So this is the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, they also were bringing in settlers into the uh, Oregon country. They were seeing the Americans come, and so they wanted to kind of stake out their territory. Small individual pa uh, pr parties uh, made the overland journey to the Willamette Valley. Contemporaneously, the British Hudson's Bay Company subsidized about 25 families from the Red River Settlement in Manitoba. Francois Xavier Mathieu, a former trader with the American Fur Company, arrived at the French Prairie. Uh, French Prairie. Mathieu, a French uh, Canadian, was an educated man. He lived with Etienne Lucier at Champouy farming and doing carpentry work. In 1844, he married Rosalie Osant of Manitoba. They had 15 children and settled in Butteville, where he operated a retail store. I think it may be still standing, or I don't know. Became a constable of the provisional government. He later served in the state legislature. I think he was the last one, last survivor of the people that signed the a petition, or agreed to the petition to have a provisional government. 1843, um, during the meetings, the French Canadians and Americans at the home of Joseph Gervais to discuss, met at the home of Joseph Gervais uh, to discuss the rising problem from predatory animals. They agreed to pay bounties for pelts of wolves, coyotes, and cougars. It was agreed that, quote, whites and their descendants would receive the full bounty for the various pelts. Indians would receive two-thirds of the bounty amounts. So you can see that there was uh, racist legislation from the very beginning. 
Elijah White called a final meeting in March 1843 in Oregon City, which included mostly American settlers who wanted a more formal government. A larger meeting was called for May 1843, at which attended a larger group of about 100 Americans and French Canadians, about half the male population of the Willamette Valley. They met at Shampooey and engaged in vigorous debates on how to form a government based on civil codes and the election of civil authorities. Although there were vocal opposition from most of the French Canadian settlers, as many as seven French Canadians voted to join with the Americans to form a local government. These were Pierre Bellic, Francoise Bernier, David Dompierre, Joseph Gervais, uh, Xavier Ladero, Etienne Lucier, Francois Mathieu. Mountain man and fur trapper Robert Newell, married to a Nez Perce woman, called, recalled that Gervais, Lucier, Bellic, Bernier, Ladero, Dompierre, and others supported the initiative, emphasizing, quote, the motion to organize prevailed by a majority of five. But had the Frenchmen opposed the motion, the motion would have been defeated. Gervais, Bellic, Lucier, and Ladero were longtime residents with large land holdings. For 10 years, they had taken leadership roles along with the American Methodist on intercommunity projects and issues such as the trial of Jean Baptiste Perrault. Given the audible groundswell of American colonial aspirations, they had a vivid interest, a vested interest in retaining a voice in the development of the new country. As for their larger group of Canadians who opposed the 1843 petition organizing efforts, a sense of their views was gleaned from a petition they had written for them by Father um, Antoine Langlois, um, another missionary that came, they identified themselves as Canadian citizens, settlers of the Willamette. The signatories, Joseph Gervais, Francoise Rivette, Sidney Smith, Charles Pickett, S.M. Holderness, representing uh, the larger French Canadian settlers, they expressed a willingness to participate in the creation of institutions for the benefit of the community at large but they preferred a more limited role for the proposed government. A lot of people would understand about that now. They stated explicitly that they would not support any new petitions to the US government because the Oregon boundary question had yet to be resolved, perfectly reasonable. The Canadians also voiced concerns about equitable representation, substantial government expenses requiring heavy tax burden, who wanted that? Bureaucracy, I mean, these were mountain men, you know, farmers, they didn't want more bureaucracy. The issuance of land titles that may not be legal when the international boundary was finally established. The French Canadians were concerned less with British interests than with protecting their own rights and property, um, and proper own rights and property in light of assertive posturing by the American settlers. They were concerned for their families and the large native population of Kalapuya. And these, and these are people that registered their lands with a provisional government, which was one of the uh, rules. You can see that these are people that had every intention of staying here, so they followed the laws, even though they may not have agreed with them. The French Canadian eventually gave their support to the Oregon country provisional government. Some were able to assume positions in the provisional government, for example, Francois Mathieu as constable and justice of the peace. In 1844, Joseph Jersey, Pierre Bellic, Etienne Lucier, Francois Benier, Nicole, Nicolas Montour, Louis Piquet served as grand jurors in Champouy County for the government circuit court. The majority of the French Canadians, Anglo Canadians, Americans were willing to pay taxes to the new government. A solid majority of the French Canadians 84 through 1984, 1845 to 1848, registered their land claims with the Oregon Provisional Government. John McLaughlin and James Douglas, he was a mixed blood Dutch Caribbean, 
and he was a, one of the chief factors at the Hudson's Bay Company, also joined the provisional government in order to represent the interests of, of the settlers uh, north of the Columbia River. Although the French Canadians were able to have voting rights written into the organic law for their mixed race sons, race remained a potent topic in Oregon political uh, culture. The influx of more Euro-American settlers brought with them also the attitudes, uh, excuse me, the attitudes, um, hold on, sorry, lost my place. Uh, about racial equ uh, equality and the notion that the U U.S. had a divine right to take over the continent and push out all European interests, not just Indian interests, anybody that was not American interests, so that included French, Spanish. There was a large, huge divide in religion and culture between the French Indian families and the overlanders that was never fully resolved and led to racialism in the early years of the Oregon Territory. The French Indian families strove to navigate a middle course to protect the interests of their children. They desired to cooperate while maintaining their cultural practices, legal standing, and property rights. The rivalry between the United States and Great Britain over the Oregon County intensified and was settled in favor of the United States with the Oregon Treaty of 1846, as we can see in the, map, in the picture. The International Boundary Treaty was set at the 49th parallel, creating Oregon territory that included present-day Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and parts of Montana. This marked the turning point for the French prairie settlement. The migration of 875 Euro-Americans tipped the racial dominance away from the mixed race families to the mostly European descendants. The American settlers heightened conflicts with the region's indigenous inhabitants over land and natural resources. The Americans brought a multi-secular agrarian pastoral tradition um, more, uh, excuse me, that was in direct conflict with the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest. More diseases were introduced, more implementation of legal statutes and social practices that were based on white supremacy. These changes mark the beginning of the end, mark the beginning of the end of an earlier heterogeneous and more accommodating colonial society in which demographic realities in the Willamette Valley had left no group dominant on the other. Those were gone those days. The French Indian families of the French Prairie witnessed a contraction of the earlier reliance on cross-cultural flexibility as American immigrants continued to stream into the Willamette Valley. Within a decade, the Americans began to actively push for the removal of all native groups east of the Cascades and thereby forced the French Indian families to face difficult choices about their allegiances and subsequent violent conflicts between native peoples and the American settlers. Hudson's Bay in 1850s, Hudson's Bay Company was gradually withdrawing its presence in Oregon and shifting it to Canadian Northwest. The U.S. government was highly motivated to secure its power over the very rich and prosperous lands of the West. The Oregon Donation Land Act in 1850 provided for the transfer of so-called public lands to white settlers. It granted 320 acres to single white male settlers at least 18 years of age and 640 acres to married couples with each spouse owning 320 acres in his or her own right. Now that is revolutionary, only in Oregon, right? It's like the bottle law. <laughs> it has that kind of impact. And some of these spouses were native, native women who could leave, who had the right to leave that property to their children and grandchildren. The land claims of the Indian women were valid if their husbands were white. In French Indian families uh, were well aware of the outside forces that threatened to take away all they had worked for decades to build. The federal census of 1850s shows the population of French Prairie was about 265 adults, 292 children under the age of 21. That's a lot of children. I'm, I suspect that some of them were actually orphans that were taken into the families. Um, of the 114 French-speaking households listed in the census, 108 were headed by men and six by women. The racial makeup of the wives was 58% French Indian, 38% Native, 
2.5% Anglo-American and 1% Anglo-Indian, decidedly in the majority. Between 1849 and 1860, the local community registered intent to become citizens of the United States. The motivation, as always, was to gain patents to their land and secure a future for their children. The territorial government passed laws um, prohibiting citizenship to mixed race men. There were those in the legislature that attempted to ameliorate these laws unsuccessfully. There were many right-minded uh, American settlers who came who did not believe in this. They did want them to have the rights to the land, but they were in the minority. 1859, Marion County people, mixed blood and whites, petitioned for full citizenship of mixed race men. They petitioned, these are neighbors, business partners, son-in-laws, neighbors, customers, business partners, 150 men signed the petition, including Anglo and immigrant settlers, but the, it was defeated. So I wanted to show you here, I thought this was interesting, I took the time to copy it, type it, copy it into this, because I wanted you to see that of the signers of the um, provisional government, signers, the supporters, uh, who voiced their vote in favor of the provisional government, Everything in red are their spouses. They were married to native people. And this is something in history that we don't hear about, that is not written anywhere, except in this magnificent book written by Marie um, Melinda Jete. Uh, here's another interesting fact. These are all the missionaries. Do you see anything of interest here? Just go ahead, raise your hand. Do you see anything of, that's interesting? What you see is that the, the, they married one, two, they, women died. They died of hardship and in childbirth. So you can see why having a native wife was actually the preferred spouse, because they could withstand this really, really, really harsh environment. And so I thought that was amazing when I started doing the, writing it all down, how many women uh, missionaries came here and died. Uh, again, we have, you know, Anglo-American men, Euro-American men, who some of them uh, had native wives. But these native wives probably dressed and their culture was pretty pro more closer to American because they were daughters of, of the wealthy landowners and they inherited, and these are women that you would marry. There was nobody that was a widow or unmarried for very long. It was just the, the culture. People just didn't do that. And again, we go back to... Um, all the people that are in red, they're the wives, native wives of the people that agreed to have the provisional government. And these are my sources. The major source, uh, I, well, after reading that story, I wanted more information. So I read Men of Champui, and that obviously was not satisfactory to me. Then I found the, at the heart of the cross races, and that told me everything. That opened up everything to me, and from the information I learned there, I started doing research, uh, my own research, to support, you know, or to find out where she got her information. And uh, she didn't get it from the internet, and she didn't get it from other books, because it's not written anywhere. She had to go to the records and the journals to get this information. And also I found this really interesting book, Children of the Fur Trade. It focuses mostly on the Canadian fur traders, but it's still interesting. Um, information because it, obviously we didn't know what was French, what was British, what was American. It was all mixed. And so I got information um, about the Canadian fur traders, but it also spilled over into Oregon and gave me a lot of good information. So anybody have any questions? Hi, this is Mika. Um, I didn't see on the list, I'm here. I didn't see on your list of names the Dorians. Were they? I did mention them, yes. Yes, but I didn't see them anywhere on that list of, of uh, people no. who were settlers there. No. That's interesting. They weren't. Not in the shampoo. Remember, um, there, there is the little tiny, I don't think it's a town anymore, but it's called St. Louis. 
and that's just south of uh, Shampui. You go to Donald and you head south, uh, and then there's like a cemetery, it's called Dorian Cemetery, St. Louis, and I think maybe that's where they may have settled. But they didn't, if, if they settled there, they, like a lot of them, did their own thing. Some of them didn't want to have anything to do with government. They, made, they staked their territory. They wanted to do their own thing. They were free spirits. That's not, that was not uncommon. Of course, they're, they're illiterate. They're not going to write it down. So, yeah. OK, this is Irene. So if you went back a couple of frames, there was a man who had three wives, but the first two divorced him. And uh, I thought that was a little unusual since you said so divorced? many divorced. No, they died. Oh, I thought it said they divorced. Oh, maybe they divorced. Okay. I wondered that. Can, that uh, seems real unusual. Well, if can, that, if I read it right. I'd like to bring up my little side thing. I don't know how to get back. Sorry. I want to bring up the little side. You want I just want to yeah. make sure it was really divorced. I can go to because the exact. That's, who divorced in those days? Is that the one you yeah. I'll just leave that up so that I can go back to where I need it. So uh, it'll be the it'll be this that one right there, yes, right there, yeah, right there, that one. Okay, that's what I need. Okay, so um, not there, no further along. Another one. Where is it? Forward. Okay, there. Does it say? Oh, oh, the Nez Perce wife. Oh, she divorced. Yeah. Oh, there are two divorced? of them that divorced. Two of them. What kind of a man was he? Two well, that's wives Joseph, divorced. That is him. Joseph Meek. Now, I remember I told you I told you a small story. If I were to tell you the story of each one of these men, it would take up two hours just to tell each one of their stories. They're amazing people. Not, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you the good bits. But some of these people were horrid people, and some of the men. Um, Prostitution, uh, well, they don't talk about prostitution because these were not common law wives, but prostitution was practiced. You know, it was just another economic unit that you exchanged. It was not a big deal. And some of the people that were, um, if you had a slave, you didn't have a choice about what you did. You had to, they would become prostitutes. So um, if jo Joseph Meek, I don't know who the whole biography of Joseph Meek, but if he was an abusive person, they had a right to leave him. How they, how they separated and divorced, I don't know how. But they could have just said, I am walking out the door, and I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Somebody wrote that down. So, and, and that would be called a divorce, a divorce. Is that what your question was? You're looking for the legal aspect of why? It was. It was probably because of drink and abuse. And those are, you know, like forever and ever. That's the, that's the issue. Huh? There aren't many divorces. You know, it also could be that the women found other people that they were more interested in. You know, that, why, is, why is that not a possibility? Yeah. Yeah. The women were just as free, just, just as free to find their own, you know, uh, part, life partners as the men were. Because these women didn't need these white settlers to ha make a living. They didn't depend on them. They can, perfect, they can get along perfectly well on their own. So, there you go. Hi. Yes. Oh, uh, oh Karen. Karen. No, this <laughs> I'm in trouble. No, you're not. Uh, <laughs> um, you mentioned St. Louis. Yeah. North of Woodburn there. Um, the book, A Name of Her Own, you familiar with it? There's a book, A Name of Her Own, written by an Oregon author that someone remembers the name of the author, but I don't. Oh. Jane Kirkpatrick. Oh, it. Jane Kirkpatrick, yeah. yeah. She wrote a book, A Name of Her Own, and it's in there, in the back, it says yeah. that she's buried there. Murray Dorian is yeah. buried there at St. Louis. It's a, there's a little church there or something. I think it's, isn't it Fitzpatrick? Or is it, oh, no, it's Kirkpatrick. Yeah, I believe, I know about Jane Kirkpatrick. I've read some of her books, and she's written some books about local um, women, uh, local uh, pioneers. Yeah, and uh, I, I haven't read the other ones. <clears throat> um, I was never quite sure that her information was true to history, honestly. So uh, I've, I decided not to read anything that was fiction because I couldn't, 
guarantee. I preferred reading a scholarly book about this information because they have to. Uh huh. Excuse me. The church there. Yeah. Well, it is. Um, yeah, I've been to that sem that Pioneer Cemetery. Uh, by the way, I'm willing to take a group of you who are interested to the area, and we can visit all the Pioneers cemeteries in St. Paul, Butteville, and St. Louis. So I'll send an email out. If you're interested, just sign up. Okay. Go ahead. Question over here, Anka. My next. Joel, yeah. You were, you were talking about uh, the, the ownership, property ownership, and, and the legality of that was an important issue to these mixed families. How did, how did, how, I ch you touched on this, how was it resolved when the Homestead Act came in? Would somebody superimpose the Homestead Act over property that was already supposedly owned by another family, or did they have separate rights by that established so that it wouldn't be taken away from them under that? They, all they had, to, remember the, the, the government was taken over by people that were suppressing the rights of Native people. I mean, they legally, did this, and uh, legally, they did it. I mean, they, this was now the United States, and this was now a territory, and these were now the laws of the land. And they did pass the laws, even though I would say the majority passed them, but there was, an, there was a vocal minority that didn't agree with this. And so, yes, only people that were white could inherit, so they started, little by little, the people that were of mixed blood were dispossessed of their land. And I know that from the book, some of the people knew that the writing was on the wall. So they sold their land to, you know, if somebody from uh, Euro-American came and said, and, you know, I'll sell you my land because they're going to take it away anyway, that's what they would do. I mean, that's the logical thing to do. And they moved elsewhere. They didn't die out. They went uh, uh, in other parts. They went with their, uh, the wise families to their reservation or they went to Montana, they went to Idaho, they went to other places, they didn't die out, but they, were, they no longer were part of Shampooey. Uh, any more questions? I don't see any hands raised. Yes, we have a few over there. Carmen. Okay, the, the kind of a general idea of French Perry, uh, French Prairie. I yeah, let me go. Let me go to that one, that map. It includes maybe areas across the freeway over there in the east. Okay, it's hard to see from there. Thank you. It is. So yeah, here's Marion County, and then you have Clackamas County and Yamhill. And you can see the Willamette River, and you can see the Pudding River. And the Pudding River, the original name of the Pudding River was Baudin. I mean, and the story is that the blood of uh, the deer, because the French love blood pudding, uh, it was there that they set up camp, hunting camp, and they made Baudin de Sangre. And that was the original name, was Baudin de Sangre. And they called it Pudding River, because it's really... In French, it means pudding. But yeah, the, you can see uh, the, that's a big area, still a big area. And the Willamette River is extremely important. I've kayaked as close as I can get to Shampooey, but there's whole stretches of it that are so long that I haven't been able to kayak the whole thing. It takes a long time. So I'm doing it in sections. And the water, however, in certain sections is really flat and beautiful. So there would be a lot of activity off of that river and into the villages along the river, um, on both sides of the river. Oh, hi. Um, I was just in St. Louis last weekend. Uh, the, there's a Catholic church and a hall that get used all the time. And I think there's a series of fishing ponds called the St. Louis Ponds right around there between St. Louis and Jervis. I have not heard of them, not yet, but thank you for letting me know. Oh, ready to go. Have you 
uh, been through the Pioneer uh, Cemetery at St. Paul. I'm yeah, trying to I, retrace oh, Dorian. Paul, yes, I have. There's two of them. Madame Dorian, because you know she overwintered uh, uh, in La Grande. I mean, we live mm -hmm. in La Grande about. I, I don't years. know and a lot about she, uh, Dorian. Well, I just say that she. We. I. I do know it's history that she uh, came back and found her encampment of French traders and has it all massacred. So mm -hmm. she kept her horse at the base of the Blue Mountains on the east side of the Blue Mountains mm -hmm. and overwintered mm -hmm. and ate the horse and had her child and in the springtime made it over to Pendleton or the Umatilla tribe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she went further than that, but I thought she worked her way to you French know, Prairie, but I'm not sure. You know, none of the information I have talks about um, her name is really Marie Langevois, and Dorian is her husband's name. What I know of, what I've read, is that her husband was brutal. He was a really awful person, and I don't, I don't think her son Paul Dorian was any got to be any better. So all I know is that she led a very sad life because of the brutality of her husband. But that's all I know. I don't know any details about her. Yeah, because she wasn't part of the shampooy study that I was looking into. She, yeah, she had. She and her husband had no contact at all with the French Canadians of the shampooy area, because otherwise their name would have come. There up. might be others here who've had the same experience, but what a great experience through the shampooy shampooy uh, historical society there is they have. During the summer, you go on a school bus, and they take you on a tour of the cemeteries. And at the cemeteries are people in period costumes assuming the characters of who's buried there. And they tell their life story in the first person. I'm so-and-so, and I died in childbirth. And, you know, and it really brings it all to life, sort of. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they do great things at the Shampooey uh, State Park. And it's a great place to go walking, hiking. You can have a nice little vigorous hike there too. Yes, Sally. Um, yes, yeah, Sally Shriver. Um, is this Dorian that you keep talking about, is she the woman that went across country? Nothing about her. <laughs> Pardon? I don't know anything about Marie Dorian. Does anybody else know? Um, yeah, and pregnant, she was, went along. Anyway, okay. Well, she did not, she was not the first to have a mixed race child, no. <laughs> that I can tell you for sure. The first mixed race children were being born back in the late 1700s. So, yeah, this is, you know, mythology is really hard to break. And uh, anyway, enough said. <laughs> okay, yes. I was, I was just going to make no. mention of the fact that west of Jervis and north of Salem, actually west of I-5, is where the St. Louis Ponds are. And it's the, a what? the St. Louis Ponds okay. you, that were mentioned. It's a wonderful place to go visit and walk around. I plan on it. Okay. Yeah. This is Maureen. For two summers, a professor at Oregon State had received permission to do an archaeological dig inside Shampooey State Park. And I think it was every Wednesday during the summer when they were digging, they invited the public to come. And she explained exactly what they were doing, how far they had gone back, and they had set up a tent showing everything they had found and they were, you know, doing their cataloging. So I noticed that one of your sources was OSU Press. Are they known as a place where they are doing research into this group of people? Well, I know the book that I read, which is about, uh, mostly about the Canadian fur trappers and, and the ones that made it to the you know, Willamette Valley. Um, it was very detailed, and, and it wasn't written in a scientific way. It was written more in a very fun way and lots of information, but I don't know. But I didn't read anything about the archaeology there. I think the, I went to one of these little groups with, with my grandchildren 
so that they could see some of the archaeological things that they dug up. And they would pass it around the children. And they say, well, what do you think this was used for? Because you know we can look at instruments back then, and we have no clue what they used it for. Um, but which I think is kind of fun. But you know, the shampoo area was taken over, I mean. And so it was superimposed on whatever people were there, superimposed was the American things. Because the native people and the native women, who were the housewives, they didn't need metal. They didn't need things from, they were already doing everything they needed to do. We, um, I, one thing I forgot to mention, in the very beginning, they were do fur trapping, which is extremely important. It's a, it, was a, it was a huge economic um, money maker doing fur trapping and, and, get, and processing. It was the native women that were processing the pelts in their traditional way. So they were unpaid processing of a really lucrative thing for the Hudson Bay Company and for the Pacific Fur Company. Thank you.